Hello, friends. Grab your Bible and a friend and sit back as we explore God's Word together on this edition of House Calls. Welcome to House Calls, the program that we believe is the most important thing on television right now, or else we wouldn't really be on it. Good to have you, John. It's good to be here. I tell you, whenever we get together, it's a praise the Lord. We can, we've been working together so long that we kind of know each other in the thinking even aspects of, of well, well, we actually kind of knew that before we ever started the program, which is one of the reasons this program exists, because right. we said, you know, we're on the same wavelength a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And so uh, anyway, I think it shows up here. Praise the Lord. And so we would encourage you to get your Bibles and, and join us for a thoughtful hour in studying God's Word together. This program is made up of not only the topics, and we're going to begin a new topic today called discipleship. Not membership, not fellowship, not friendship, but discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? And we're going to look at that not only from the New Testament, but also from the Old Testament perspective, because the Lord has always wanted us to be more than we thought we can be. And there's a method by which our own growth and use in ministry is made possible, and discipleship is significant when it comes to who you become in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go in, let, letting you know uh, where to send your questions and comments. We always believe it's important to pray and ask for the Lord's leading. And John is always the on-air designated one who prays. So John, pray for us. Thank you. Father in heaven, again, we ask for your spirit to be here with us as we study your word. Uh, we cannot understand the things of God unless your spirit tells us and teaches us um, what you're doing here through your word. And so we pray that you would be here with us and speak to each person listening and viewing this program. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that prayer, John. I really appreciate it. This topic is going to be an exciting one, but before we do anything, we get into our Bible questions. That's right. Bible questions are so important. We always thank you for sending those questions and comments. And uh, if you have any that you would like to send, send those questions and comments to housecalls at 3abn.org. That's housecalls at 3abn.org, and we surely do appreciate it. Um, what do you have today, John? I know you have a question. Well, yeah, I've got a, a question here from David. And he says, uh, what does the Bible say about giving testimony in places where a believer in Christ feels he or she isn't allowed to grow in his or her convictions of the Bible, hmm. like being part of a circle of meditation in school. Could it be rightly justified to desire to change schools? Um, so we have to infer a few things from this. Uh, it sounds like uh, the school is not allowing them to give a testimony, to express their convictions. Um, but more than that, they probably have some wide differences of opinion in regard to those convictions. Mm -hmm. um, the one text that comes to mind, John, is the one where Jesus send, is sending out his disciples. And he says, I'm sending you out as lambs among Whoa. wolves. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus knows that the gospel was going to be going to all the world under duress. So in many respects, I would, I would advocate for someone to, uh, to share their faith in areas where the gospel's needed. Um, and I'm just speaking in practical terms here at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but in some cases where it becomes oppressive, say in a school that you have to attend or a place you have to work or something, to, not, to be shut down and to not be allowed to... Um, more than not be allowed to express your opinions, but when you express your opinions to, be, to come under great scrutiny, uh, I would say that, yes, there, I don't think that's something that we need to subject ourselves to. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the reasons why the Seventh-day Adventist Church has the largest Protestant parochial school system in the world, mm -hmm. is because we believe that people should be able to grow up in an environment that is conducive to allowing them to share their faith and express their uh, their growth in Christ and what Christ means to them without having to be under duress. 
And so it's one of the things that um, we believe in as Seventh-day Adventists that our church is, is very strong in, that education isn't just a knowledge of the arts uh, or knowledge of sciences or mathematics, but it includes the whole person. It's a holistic approach to our education system. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly what David is going through, but it could be, yes, that he, he may need to look to move elsewhere where he can feel less under duress um, to be able to share his faith and things. Yet, there are some that do advocate or do take the position that when they're amongst people that don't know the gospel or haven't heard the gospel, that it's a great opportunity to share their faith. And so sometimes uh, God calls us into those situations as well. I don't know where they are or where David is in his, in his education either. It could be that he's in college or something. Um, maybe there are no opportunities for uh, for um, a school system that is supportive of his beliefs. But we are called regardless, and I think you know this too, John, that we're to share our faith wherever we go. Um, there may be limits to that, but uh, sharing doesn't mean just with words. Uh, the, a loving, kind of, uh, Christian that is encouraging, that is positive, can be a larger, a greater testimony than someone that tells the facts the intellectual facts about the gospel. That's right. So I think there's that aspect to consider too. So hopefully, you know, I've covered a few areas that they that David may be able to think about here in his decision as to where he might go from here. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. That's more along the lines of counsel to give somebody uh, insight to what the future holds and how the how the Lord could lead and guide in that particular uh, particular uh, venture for the future. Todd from Kentucky. Todd sent us a snail mail. It says, please help me with this. I've heard several teachers say Christ is going to destroy the wicked at the second coming, oh, a.k.a. rapture. And that is the visible snatching away of the church. But I can't find it. The closest I can get to it is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. Let's start by looking at 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8, and I'll share with you another, another couple of scriptures that will give you some support in that area. Okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, and I have it here in front of me. It says, and the lawless, here I am, okay. We always appreciate these texts. Here it is, okay. And, um, here we are, okay. 2 Thessalonians, verse 2, 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That is, in fact, speaking particularly about the man of sin. Mm -hmm. And the man of sin, uh, in fact, speaks of the deception or is connected to the deception that Second uh, Thessalonians re refers to, let no one deceive you by any means that that day will not come unless there comes a falling away first. The man of sin is connected to that. But um, he, that is speaking particularly of the man of sin. But to give you a broader view, go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. You see, the clear suggestion is one of the reasons why the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of the coming of the Lord is they have not been given immortality. They don't have immortality. So they cannot withstand. Who shall stand in the evil day? They cannot stand. Who shall be able to stand? They won't be able to stand. Jeremiah 25, verse 33 Hmm. I'll start with verse 31. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. And here's the text. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. That is when he returns, because he returns uh, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. But it says in verse 32, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And verse 33, And at that day the slain of the Lord 
shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. In other words, when that comes, the wicked are going to be dead everywhere. And the reason why they're going to be dead everywhere is as Matthew talks about, there are two categories, the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. The sheep will be gathered into the barn, that is into the harvest. They'll be gathered in, and I'll use the wheat here. The wheat will be gathered into the harvest because they're the wheat. But the tears, which also is represented by the goats, will be gathered and bound in bundles to burn. So you see clearly, and when the Lord comes back with the brightness of his coming, uh, the Bible says, a fiery stream shall issue and come forth from before him. A fiery stream, that's the glory of his second coming. That is the fire that, as Peter says, uh, the day that comes shall burn them up. The day that comes is burning as an oven. Uh, do you have that one in um, Peter? But what I want to go to now is the reference or the suggestion I made in, in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation now. Revelation chapter 6. What will the wicked be doing on that day that will, that will cause them to be, um, that will cause them to be fearful of the coming of the Lord? Notice what the Bible says, uh, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us, that's that destruction, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Mm -hmm. So the wrath of God uh, will be poured out on those who are alive. That is the wicked that are alive. And that's why when the Bible speaks about the second death, even if you were, even if you never died before the coming of the Lord, you will experience the first death. And that's why the Bible always refers to the wicked who are ultimately destroyed as this is the second death. Mm -hmm. Some wicked people have already died. They'll come up in the second resurrection to be destroyed in the lake of fire. But the wicked that be alive when Jesus comes will be slain by the brightness of his coming. And that's in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8, pretty much. Yeah, I think one of the confusing things in regard to the secret rapture is those that pick and choose scriptures from the Bible to support that are confusing the two times that he will come. <laughs> you know, the Bible is clear that there's a second coming. That's right. And at the second coming, there'll be a resurrection of the saints. That's right. But it also says that there will be a third coming, which is after the thousand years. That's right. For the judgment, where the judgment seat of God is set and all must appear before that judgment seat, um, those who have done um, evil. And those two passages, those two events and the descriptions of them in scripture are confused as, 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 bookends of a seven years of tribulation, which is the, what the secret rapture theorizes. Right. Where there's a secret rapture at the beginning, the church is taken up and they're out of, away from the tribulation. The tribulation happens for seven years and at the end, Jesus comes down with the saints. Mm. Uh, but the truth is, is that the saints go up at the second coming with Christ in a visible second coming. And that at the end of the thousand years, there's a third coming of Christ with the saints in the new Jerusalem that sits down on the earth. And that's described in Revelation chapter 21. Mm. So th this is the confusion that sometimes is, sometimes is there. And there are passages throughout scripture, as you mentioned from Jeremiah, that speak of the coming of the Lord. Which one is it? Where is it, where is it placed? That's true. And understanding those events can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but if you put all the text together, you will find very clearly there's no secret rapture. There's no time where Jesus comes, but he doesn't appear. That's right. Uh, there's a rapture of the saints, which is described in 1 Thessalonians 4, a, a ca catching them up to meet them in the air, to meet him in the air, but Christ is visible in his second coming and he meets him there. There's also a resurrection at that same time uh, that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 um, describes. And so uh, I, I think some of this confusion comes from uh, 
uh, dispensational theories that have happened and it came out in the uh, uh, seven, 16, 1700s mm -hmm. that have become very confusing today because of books published. Uh, in fact, it goes back even to Darby and Schofield. That's right. John and so and Darby. the secret rapture, there's no secret about the rapture. We agree with a rapture, a catching up of the saints, mm -hmm. but usually the word rapture is used in the context of a secret rapture, and that's just, it's, he won't find it because it's not here. That's right, it's not in scripture. Yeah. And so to add another component to this, uh, because there's another question somebody asked me, John, here, and let me just read this to kind of cap, to connect it together because these are two pretty much along the same line. It says, Dear Pastors, Am I to understand that at the second resurrection the wicked die at the brightness of God? Therefore they died before the fire came down from heaven? No, that's not the case. They tried to, and I could understand that, so that, thank you for the question so we can clarify this. The wicked that are destroyed at the brightness of the coming of the Lord is when Jesus comes back, we'll, we'll, the, the, second, the second coming, we're waiting for him. That's what's going to happen when Jesus returns. He's already come and he walked the earth, but when he comes again, the brightness will destroy the wicked and they'll be dead for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years, they are resurrected in the second resurrection. Uh, John 5, verse 28 and 29, the Bible says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The King James Version says, a uh, resurrection of damnation, meaning they're going to be condemned. And that second resurrection, Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. Right. So the second resurrection is the second death, and they don't occur at the same time. And so in, in context to that, let me read to you to give you what's going to happen at the, at the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 3. I'm going to read down to verse 5. Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. So when the Lord comes, he's not going to be silent. A fire shall issue and come forth from before him. That is the brightness of his coming that will devour the wicked. And the unfortunate thing is, <laughs> John, sad part about that is that's just the beginning. They lay on the ground. They are not lamented nor gathered nor buried, as we just read in Jeremiah 25. Nobody's there. There are no funeral parlors. Uh, there are no funeral services. There are no burial. There's nobody mourning them. They will not be lamented or gathered or buried, but they will be refuse on the ground. Can you imagine that sight, John? Um. Yeah, but my imagination, I think, falls short of how it's going to be. But it's, amazing. it's just an amazing thought. If you were to drive around the world and just look everywhere you see fallen humanity just laying there and rotting for a thousand years, just, and when the thousand years the earth would have been, somebody showed a time lapse once. I saw this on History Channel. Someone showed a time lapse. If all humans died and from a, some kind of, they call it some kind of uh, atomic blast, they don't use the word atomic, I think plutonium blast, where it only killed humans, this kind of whatever they use, but it didn't destroy buildings. It only killed humans, not even animals. And they showed how the planet will become overrun, buildings will just start to decay and fall apart. Wherever, you know, we cut our lawns, all of a sudden wild grass will grow and trees will start growing out of anywhere and break through the, f and they said everything around us will just begin to fall apart. Mm. And I could imagine a thousand years with the earth unattended. Can you imagine the decay and just a natural process of degradation that takes place at the end of the thousand years? That's why the Bible says they become refuse on the ground, yeah. clothing strewn that just rot, bodies everywhere, skeletals mm. that have just become, uh, I mean, it's, just, it's an awesome sight. So why would you reject Jesus? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Wow. Uh, I have a quick question here um, from Carlos. Okay. 
And he was watching the program on the day that he, he sent this question in. And he says in John 6, 65, God calls people to him. Why would he call people who would fall away? Mm. Um, I think uh, there, there are some different theories out there as to um, predestination. Okay. And I think in some cases uh, that word is very misunderstood. Because in Titus, Paul says very clearly uh, that the salvation of God has appeared to all men. Everyone right. has an opportunity to be saved. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ has, has put off his second coming, as we just talked about, so that no one would have to perish. Mm -hmm. So this time of probation, so to speak, for mankind is being left open so that everybody could hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, God is inclusive. He's trying to get people in, not keep them out. And so this whole idea of predestination, that some are going to be lost uh, from the moment they're born, they're predestined to be lost, uh, uh, that comes from some of the Calvinistic teachings of the past, is just uh, not biblical. And so what Jesus is saying in John 6, 65, is more in regard to those who are following him and those who do not believe but were still following him, and that how God... Uh, would not grant them full access to Jesus uh, because of that um, ulterior motive. Hmm. Uh, Jesus wouldn't be fully manifested or understood by them because of the rejection of him. So there, what it's saying there, there are many who are in the world who profess Christ, right. but don't really follow him. And so I think their destiny depends more on uh, their decision and their commitment to follow Christ and receiving his salvation, that it does Christ holding them off mm -hmm. or not allowing them to come to him for salvation, mm. okay? So there's no predestination here going on. Uh, it's really the, the decision for us to accept salvation or to be lost because we reject it is up to us. Um, it's not up to us, we can't save ourselves but certainly uh, Jesus saves us and we must go to him for that salvation if we're going to receive it. You know, predestination, as you said, is something that's misunderstood. Jesus didn't, didn't set the world in order like us spinning a cork and just let it stay there and continue to rotate based on the draw of gravity or the magnetic fields. He didn't set the world in motion and just leave it and decide to go someplace else and he'll come back whenever he's ready. But the word predestined is used in the Bible at least four times. Mm -hmm. uh, in Romans 8, verse 29, you find this predestination that's talked about here is not predestined in the sense of controlling and manipulating, but he's made provision. That's the key. Right. Let me give you an example. If the plane was in the, in the terminal and someone bought you a ticket, they predestined you to take a trip. Yeah. But you've got to accept the journey. If you accept the ticket and the map, uh, and all the amenities that they've laid out for you, then you're predestined to have a good time. They predestined all these things, the place you're going to stay, the hotel reservations, the flight. They paid for your first class tickets. They paid for everything. That's, pre that's all set. That's predestined. It's determined right there. And so you say, well, okay, if I accept this, what happens? Then they begin to outline. The predestination that the Bible talks about is the Lord has made it possible for us, Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, Romans 8, verse 30. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord is saying, if you accept the predestined plan I have in place, you'll be not only sons, but you'll be called, you'll be justified, you'll be glorified. Once you step into my plan, these are the things that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's the predestination, not the manipulation of your life. Not like, I don't want to be saved. Please, no. Yeah. That's not what predestination is. And that's what happens in Ephesians 1.15, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So that's the whole, we want, and, and, oh, let me show you the text. First John chapter three, John, read that, unless you have one that you want to read. No, first John chapter three. First John chapter three. 
This is, this is what happens when you accept the predestined plan of God, not the manipulation of God. And it's something that works itself out gradually. Okay? What verses do you want me to read? First, John chapter 3, verse 1, and then verse 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Okay, right. What are we called? Children of God. Okay, he, he predestined us to be sons. If we accept him, we're the children of God. Keep going. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And now look at this beautiful plan, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the text again. Whom he predestined, Romans 8, 29, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. One day we will see ourselves in the glory that he always knew we could be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. He predestined us to be sons of God. Mm -hmm. And I would include there in the, in the um, text, the masculine and feminine is included in that passage. So it's not just saying sons, but it's really talking about he's predestined us to be children of God. Once you accept him, he says, now you haven't seen what you're going to look like, but I can guarantee you, I've predestined you to be formed completely to the image of the son. You will be like me for you'll see me as I am. There's another aspect of this too, is that some have said, well, if God knows that someone's going to be lost, mm -hmm. well, why does he still work so hard to bring them in? Hmm. Um, you know, God has foreknowledge, but he hasn't predetermined our destiny. Okay? Right. Those are two different things. And in this respect, God is just. He is faithful to us. He's still determined and committed to give us every opportunity to know him, to receive his salvation, and to receive eternal life. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that he forces us to do that. No. And so some will fall away. Some who have come to know him will, will fall away and will be lost. Um, but he still gives them an opportunity. I think, think about a parent. Mm -hmm. I think if a parent knew ultimately what would happen with their child if it was bad, mm -hmm. they would still love that child and do all they could to, to give them the opportunity. Um, and that's a parent, um, but, you know, we as parents don't have that foreknowledge. We don't know, but to God, for God to actually know that shows his great love, I think, even to a greater extent than we as parents. True. We don't know these things, but the Lord knows he sees us where we are and where yeah. we can be. Still, he pursues us and wants to save us. And, and that's why it's a blessing. And so when we fall away, we talked about that in 2 Thessalonians, that that day will not come unless there comes a falling away first. Some people are going to fall away. Hebrews 6, verse 4, uh, Hebrews 6, 6, if they fall away, let me read verse 4, for it is impossible for those who once were enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. They tasted all that. They had samples of all of that. Mm -hmm. Verse six, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to an open shame. What's happening there is when people decide to fall away and, and sadly, John, we've experienced it as pastors. There are some people that know the message inside out. And we come up against the wall. What could we tell them? Some people know the message. What could we tell them? And we say, well, we're praying for you. But like the prodigal son, when some people walk away, unlike the coin that was lost and did not know it was lost, the sheep that was lost and knew it was lost, but couldn't find its way home. And they went and Jesus went to bring the sheep home. They're the prodigal sons who leave the father's house. The father can't go get him because he made the choice to leave. The father has to wait till he comes to his senses mm -hmm. and the father's waiting to welcome him back. So the Lord knows there's some, there's some sons that are going to leave the home, but by his grace, as time goes on and the spirit continues to work, they'll come to their senses and they'll go back and the father will embrace them and welcome them back into the fold. Thank you for your questions and comments. 
appreciate it very much. If you have any more to send, send those questions and comments to House Calls, housecalls at 3abn.org. And we thank you very much for all you do for this ministry. That's housecalls at 3abn.org. John, a powerful topic you've chosen today, yeah, discipleship. You've discipleship. done a lot of work on this one. Yeah, I have. And uh, as the uh, personal ministries director for the conference that I work for, part of my job is discipleship and mm -hmm. encouraging members uh, to get actively involved as disciples of Christ in the work uh, that he's doing in that local church. Mm -hmm. It helps pastors as well because uh, a lot of people think pastors are there to kind of drive the church business mm -hmm. and to get all the work done and to make things happen. But really the, the pastor, especially according to Ephesians 4, is the one of the equipper trainers of the, the members, the saints in ministry. That's right. And his or basically the success of the pastor is more determined by the response of the members in discipleship than it is how good they are as a preacher. Mm, very good point. And so discipleship itself is built into the DNA of the church. Uh, the church exists um, where disciples can come, grow in their faith, and then, um, then they share their faith with others and it increases the, and grows the church in numbers. And so since that is the case, and in looking at what Jesus did with his disciples, I think it's, it's important to remember that we are also disciples who have received a commission. And we'll, at some point here, we'll get to the Great Commission uh, in Matthew 28. Um, but uh, for now, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about discipleship and its implications in regard to the church and the church's success right. in sharing the gospel with the world. Um, the ch every church has a life cycle, and you've seen this life cycle before, John. Mm -hmm. the ch every church has a life cycle whereby, um, you know, the, the, a vision is established for a church plant, goals are set, ministry begins to happen, growth happens, and then the danger zone. You, you get to a danger zone, which is this plateau, where you start to kind of ride the wave that you've already started. And I think that's where we lose focus on discipleship. You know, visioning, um, setting goals, doing ministry, growing the church, that, those are all disciple words. But when you get to maintenance mode, Mm -hmm. This plateau that shifts into this maintenance mode. And on the, the other side of that is a slippery slope into nostalgia and the way you polarize and mm -hmm. then the death of the church. How it's always Those been. are very <laughs> anti-discipleship words. Mm -hmm. To stay in this discipleship mode as a church and to create a structure that fosters and builds discipleship is really the responsibility of the church and its leadership. Not just the pastor, but the elders of the church, deacons, deaconesses, all those who hold leadership positions within the church. I'm going to make a statement here that is kind of the, um, the, the, the catapult for all that we're going to talk about in the next couple of programs. Okay. And that is this. If discipleship was done right in the church, evangelism would largely take care of itself. That's if discipleship good. was done right in the church, if people embraced that and and... And that was a focus on being disciples of Christ. If that was done right in the church, in our churches, evangelism would largely take care of itself. Hmm. We wouldn't have to talk about, well, we got to gear up for a public meetings. We got to get out there and send some flyers out so <laughs> we can generate some interest. No, what you would have are disciples who are connecting with people outside the church. They build relationships that are intentional outside the church, and they would have people who are interested in the gospel. And then the public meeting that you eventually have, or reaping meetings we call those, would have people filling the pews to hear the gospel that is already, the seed has already been planted in them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm serious when I say this, we as a church have moved away from discipleship model, the discipleship model that Christ intended, into a kind of a, a, a leadership kind of grandstand, almost pastoral dependent model. Yeah which is not what you find in the book of Acts. Hmm. That model does not exist in scripture, the yeah. current model of pastoring that we have in the church. You know, we, like you and I, we know sports and we play basketball and baseball, some in football. Uh, it's, always, it's almost become like a football game. They come to cheer on the players. Yeah. And, uh, but they don't get any trophies. They don't get any bonuses. Yeah. <laughs> They're in yeah. the stands week to week. They don't, and unfortunately, you know, we have to say, who's to blame? 
us. We're to blame. That's right. We can't blame the membership. We have to say, okay, yeah, when you get visions and goals and, and ministry and growth, that plateau, you have to always remember in every season, and we talk about this, and let me go back to the model of, of sports, there's a season because they cheer at the end of the championship. Everybody's won the big old parade, and they start it all over again. And you know why? Because they know if they skip a year, if they skip a year, this is a, this is a powerful point. If the sports teams decided we're not going to have any NBA championships this year, we're not going to have any football championships this year, we're not going to have any NFL, I mean uh, hockey championships, NHL, we're going to skip a year. You know what happens? The people plateau in their emotions. And then they say, boy, I remember the good old days when we used to have championships. We don't have them anymore. No games to go to. Nothing to look forward to on Football Sunday, I mean, Super Bowl Sunday. There's no Super Bowl Sunday this year. Mm -hmm. They get into nostalgia. They get into maintenance. And they start saying, you know what? Let's have our own football game. Yeah. And they start polarizing into small groups that want to carry on the joy. Every, all the whole focus becomes in internal. Yeah. What is someone else doing? Yeah. You know, and in fact, a lot of the things you see with a lot of these preachers that come out and they're focused on what people are dressed, how they're dressing and what they're wearing and, and how they're not living up to the standards and all that whole internal focus right. is happening because they've lost the external focus. Yeah, it becomes institutionalized. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to tell a story, and, and this story has been impactful for me, which really has launched me, to, not only just because of what I do for the, at the conference level, but um, it's helped me really become excited about this topic. Good. Um, there's a, a, a boy named Bobby, and he was, uh, every year, every summer, he got to go to grandpa's, Grandma and Grandpa's farm. Mm -hmm. Loved to go to Grandma and Grandpa's farm, see the animals, hang out with Grandma and Grandpa. It was an exciting thing. But it only lasted for a couple few days, and he was back at home, and he spent the rest of the summer at home getting ready for school the next year. Well, his parents would always tell him, well, you know, Bobby, you're too little to go stay with Grandma and Grandpa on their farm. They've got a lot of work to do during the summer, and it's very difficult. You'll, you'll, you're too small. To, you'll get in the way, and, and you won't be able to do the work that's needed there. You need to be able to be a help to Grandpa in, in working the farm. But one year, he didn't hear that from his parents. He said, he heard, Bobby, you're old enough. You're going to go stay with Grandma and Grandpa for a couple of weeks. Wow. You're going to go help out on the farm. And he was so excited. Um, Mom and Dad took him, drove him to, the, to, to Grandma and Grandpa's farm, dropped him off there. He said, okay, we'll come back and pick him up in a couple of weeks. Hopefully, it'll be a big help to you. And he can learn a lot about what farming is really about. And Grandpa said, oh, well, it'll be a thrill to have him here. So they brought him in. And he got settled in his room. And it came time for the evening to sleep. And Grandpa said, hey, Bobby, you know, we got a lot to do tomorrow. So you need to get your rest. Don't stay up. Don't get on your iPad and on your phone, all that stuff. Get some sleep. And he, he listened to Grandpa. And he got his sleep that night. Well, you know what happens early in the morning on a farm? The roosters crow, oh. and life begins at sunrise. Early. And he was up early. Grandpa was there at the doorway. Bobby, let's get up. It's time to get, to get busy. And so he showed him out. He showed him the barn. He showed him how to milk the cows. Uh, he was, he was uh, feeding the chickens, um, giving hay to the animals. Um, and then he had him do some tasks around the garden, picking some of the weeds up. They, had, mm -hmm. they were really busy. Boy, Bobby was hungry, and he could smell this wonderful smell coming from the, the kitchen. Grandma was, kitchen, was cooking in the kitchen, and finally he heard that bell. Come on, guys, come in and eat. And they went in to eat, and oh, he just ate up as, you know, he ate like he'd never eaten before. And uh, right about 40, 45 minutes after they began to eat, and he was full on his stomach, Grandpa stood up, and he said, okay, Bobby, it's time to get to work. And Bobby said, Grandpa, we've already been working. Haven't been working all morning long? Hmm. And Grandpa said, Bobby, that's not work. Them's chores. <laughs> the work, here's the point, the work is in the harvest field. Not in the house. Not around the house and in the barn. Hmm. As a disciple of Christ and as members of God's church, what we do in the business of the church as elders, as deacons, as deaconesses, as Sabbath school leaders, all those things, Dems chores. <laughs> Dems chores are like that. 
The work is out in the field. The work begins when you leave the building and you're empowered by the message you've heard, by the people to meet, to go out and share the gospel with other people. If all we're doing is hanging out with ourselves, is all we're doing is doing the business and the work of the church, we're just involved in the chores of maintaining the church. That is maintenance mode to the fullest. Right. We've got to move out and beyond in our thinking to get into the harvest field and to begin to reach the people that are starred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. And that's left to the disciples who are in fact laborers. And we know, I think we're living in a time right now, John, where Christ said, pray for laborers. There aren't enough laborers in the field. Pray for laborers that Christ, that God will send laborers into his harvest field and get involved in his work. We as his disciples, if all we're doing is the work of the church and we're not laboring in the harvest field, we're not laborers. We're just taking up space and doing chores in the church. And so this whole, this whole uh, commission of discipleship, when the Lord says, uh, go therefore and make disciples, do we misinterpret that? Go therefore and make members? You know, the word make, actually, in that passage, the word make, as you know, is not in the, the Greek. Right. The word make's not there. What it's saying is, you who are my disciples, go out and disciple other people. Right. Be disciplers. And discipling is not involved, it does not involve just the chores of the church, although some of that, the nurturing and the mentoring that happens within the church context is important. And we'll talk about that as we get further into this. Mm -hmm. But our first task really is to connect with people and to share our faith. And you can't do that. I've asked hands, a show of hands, how many people in this church, how many have mostly non-Adventist friends or non-Christian friends? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, very few hands go up. We need to be more intentional about making friends, building friendships with people that don't know Jesus. Only then, only then can we <coughs> disciple someone. And discipleship is not just by what we say, but by how we live. That's right. And it's, it's not the, by what we know right. as to how much we practice what we know either. Mm -hmm. All these things. Discipleship is bigger than we think it is. Mm -hmm. Disciple isn't just a decision, I, I will follow Jesus. Discipleship is something that we decide, we determine, we commit to doing every single day of our lives. So when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you, we have to not just say fishes of men, follow me and I will make you. When I make you, as he did to the disciples, then he sent them out. Notice he, he called them disciples when they were with him. Yeah. But he called them apostles when the New Testament church began. Apostles are simply disciples who are sent. Right, sent. Yeah. Go out. I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Yeah. Go into the highways and hedges, compel all men to come. And, uh, and Peter and the apostles and Paul and the apostles, they all recognize, well, the, my call is, as, as Paul, he traveled to so many different mm -hmm. cities in Asia Minor and also in Asia. Uh, the Corinthian church was one. He, he established two Corinthian churches uh, in the city of, in, in Greece, uh, in the city of Corinth. He established two bodies of believers. And he, but he was out planting and speaking as an itinerant person everywhere. Right. He equipped the church to carry on the work of bringing others in. That's right. And the Corinthian church was an amazing one. A lot of conflicts for sure. But discipleship was happening on a day-by-day -day basis, not on a once-a-week basis. Discipleship was happening every, every day. day. In the book of Acts, the Bible says they broke bread from house to house every day. Mm -hmm. they broke, that was a day-by-day -day responsibility. They had fellowship. And fellowship, by the way, should, be, should replace the word friendship because the Bible doesn't talk about friendship. It only talks about if you're a friend of the world and you're an enemy of God. But it talks about fellowship. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You got to walk in the light. But this fellowship now, when you have fellowship with people that are in the dark, your fellowship, and look at this carefully, the fellowship with those who are in the dark is not to create an allegiance, but to allow your light to reflect That's right. so that people can be attracted to the light. Someone once said you cannot you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I don't believe that. You can make him drink. <laughs> Take a block of salt and let him start licking it. He'll drink. Thus, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. That's right. 
So discipleship, John, as you've studied this, uh, go back through that again, the cycle of the church. I think I heard you say vision, often begin with vision. Talk yeah, about Vision that. is established for what that church will do, mm -hmm. uh, which is really Christ's vision, because he's the head of the church. Right. Goals are then set, ministry begins to happen amongst the leadership and in the equipping and training of ministry in the members. Mm -hmm. Uh, growth then occurs as a result of that. The danger becomes when you hit a plateau. Mm -hmm. The goal is to, the, the objective is to stay on the side of continuing to cast the vision, continuing to do ministry, continue to grow. But when maintenance happens, you can slip off that other side, like, okay, things are getting to be done here, into maintenance, nostalgia, polarization, and then death. So the four, so the four benefits then is vision, goals, ministry, growth. And the people that grow, go back, give them the vision. Yes. Goals, cast ministry, the cast it to the new people. Here's the vision, goal. Same thing. You ever heard the word franchise? Sure. The reason why franchises are like McDonald's is everywhere is because McDonald's has a vision which has goals, which has a, a plan for growth. They don't call it ministry. They call it staffing. Mm -hmm. Or more so, how do we uh, please our customers? So they have vision, goals. What, what kind of attitude do we have towards our customers? Yeah, their ministry is their business. Their how, business. How they, how they get their And then it leads to growth. And when they grow, they start a franchise. They sell a franchise. Keep they going. sell a franchise. It keeps going. So what has McDonald's been doing for the last 35, 40 years? Selling hamburgers, selling burgers, yeah. selling french fries. Yeah. And it's still happening because they have not lost the vision. The danger with the church is we get a vision. We get those visions on a sporadic evangelistic yeah. basis rather than a continuous basis, which in fact is the purpose that God always intended for there's the a, church to have. There's a graph that, uh, that uh, I've seen that's it's really effective, uh, how most churches are organized and how we should be organized. And okay. it's, it's basically a, a wheel with spokes going out to the tire. And that tire <clears throat> includes the various ministries of the church. So you'd have um, uh, the... the um, Sabbath school, or, or uh, you'd have outreach ministry, you'd have socials, you have all these different things that the church does. And both of the wheels are very similar in that respect. But the hub is the key. Mm -hmm. On one, the hub is the worship service. That's right. Which is the way it usually is structured, where people, the whole focus for the week is getting that worship service and doing worship. That's right. That should not be the hub of an, a thriving disciple-oriented or disciple-focused church. The hub is evangelism. Right. Worship is just one of the things, the, sp the spokes that go out to the tire. Uh, worship is, is one of the things we do as a church, but evangelism is the focus of the church, getting the message out there through these various avenues, which include worship. Worship service is not the hub. Yet we've come to believe, and it's not by intention, it's just right. has happened that way, that the worship service is the climax of what we do as a church, and it's not. And America has primarily, you know, the thing about America, we are so entertainment geared in America that the entertainment aspects, you know, we're getting ready for the game. Yeah. Hey, let's, you know, the, the, the tailgate parties and all this and you got the popcorn, the barbecue and the, we are so event oriented that we don't look at things as a continuum. Yeah. The church is never intended to be an event, but a continuum, you know, continue to do this. Yeah. Until I return. All the time. Yeah. All the time. So vision, goals, ministry, and growth. Vision, now, goals, ministry. In regard to ministry, <clears throat> there's two kinds of ministry that happens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's ministry for the church, for the sustenance of the church, which we've already talked about as being chores. Right. But then the other ministry that happens is personal ministry. <laughs> and that's the part that, of course, that's, that's what I, I oversee to try and engage people and get people involved in personal ministry. And that is according to your gifts. It may be to help sustain the church, part of your chores, but right. most of those gifts are used in your connecting with others, reaching other people and sharing that gift, being the encourager, uh, being the one that is um, uh, a leader, whatever thing uh, that you decide to do. You work to help sustain the work of the church as a church, as a, as a structure, as an organization, but you also go beyond that into the personal level. So there's two kinds of ministry that we're always doing, church ministry, and personal ministry. Mm. And both are absolutely necessary to sustain the, 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 the evangelistic work of the church. Mm -hmm. Now, here's, here's a statistic that, that's mind-blowing. And I, I recognize what I'm talking about is in North America, okay? So in different uh, countries, 
you'll have different um, uh, kinds of statistics that come up. But listen to this statistic. In North America, and this is from the NAD Ministerial Department, 50% of our pastoral workforce will be eligible for retirement in the next decade. Hmm. 50%. And we do not have nearly the numbers coming through the seminary and coming through theology degrees and other things in, in undergraduate work to replace them. Hmm. Now, the question I've asked and I ask congregations when I go and, and give this seminar is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Kind of a trick question. Well, uh, I, I like see what I'm I saying. Like, I see where you headed because you mentioned North America. That was the framework of the context. Yeah. So, is this shortage of pastors that's coming? Is this wave that's coming? Is this good, or is it bad? Hmm. Is it a problem, or is it not so much of a problem? Now, in America, <laughs> that's the context. Now, I see where you headed because in America we have this pastor-centered ministry. Uh, absolutely. But you go to South America, you go to many of the Caribbean countries, you go to India, you go to Africa, where the pastor shows up. Like Paul did, he was the itinerant. That's right. He came around. Paul was a district pastor, mm -hmm. and he had a huge district. Even the elders that he equipped and trained began to be itinerant. That's right. Preachers, they, were, they became evangelistic in their efforts to pastor several house churches, not just one. And that was the phrase that Paul used, and he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Yeah. Because when Paul, after 18 months in Greece, it was after his second journey of being there for 18 months in Greece that he planted the Corinthian church. After he, sorry, after he planted the Corinthian church, he stayed for 18 months to teach them. And then after 18 months, he left and he put Apollos in charge of the ministry at Corinth. Mm -hmm. That's why you have, I planted, Apollos watered, go. but God gave the increase. Right, we all work together. And Apollos came from Mesopotamia to be a part of that ministry. Mm -hmm. He became a part of the Corinthian ministry. But Paul was already gone. Yeah. He was now going to other districts to do all the work that God had given him in other Paul places. Paul discipled Apollos That's right. and left him then to disciple others. That's right. Discipleship is about uh, passing on that knowledge and that experience to other people who can then do the same thing that you've been doing, spread the gospel and grow the church. You know, you, you've seen the 440 in the Olympics. Is the 440 two times around or one time around in a regular track or the 220? The, you know, the relay. I, I don't even remember. I, okay, so think, I think it's one, but. Okay. Well, let's use the 440 or the 880. Let's just use this as my own example of the relay. This is my example. It may be completely Olympic incorrect, but you have four guys that begin a relay race and they can do two laps around the track. And what happens is the first guy that began is going to be the guy that ends. So you start with the baton, but you, you pass the baton to the next guy. He runs. He passes it to the next guy. He runs. He passes it to, to the next guy. So one lap includes all four guys at different intervals. Mm -hmm. And the first guy that ran again is waiting for the second lap. He starts all over again. That's how the, that's how the cycle of evangelism yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. The vision, the goals, the ministry, the growth. They're, they are running so to speak, they're, they're running circles, yeah. but the circle is the cycle of the growth of the church. Yeah. And, 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 the coach is the, and the coach is the one who equipped them to do that. In, the, in a later program, we're gonna cover what's called, I put together as a disciple making matrix. Okay. So we don't need to answer just the question is what is a disciple? We need to answer the question is how do we come, become a disciple making church? Because that's the key. Hmm. How do we build a structure, an organization that is much more organic that is movable, that will do these things, that won't build in almost a, a tendency to stagnation. We've mm -hmm. got to get away from that. So I, I've got a matrix that we'll cover here in a future one. Um, but, but let me share this. Um, there is a negative correlation between pastor dependence and discipleship. Mm. Negative correlation. So you know what that means? That means the more pastor dependent you are, the less disciple focused or disciple oriented you are. Right. The more you're looking at the pastor to do this or that, the less you're, you're looking to Christ to work in you, right. his will and his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. So what I say often is you've got these churches that are a little more polarized. They're on the right side of that life cycle. They're going down. They're the ones that will have the greatest number of complaints against the pastor. Right, because, because they're, they're focused on the pastor making the church succeed. Uh, I also do church consults. Okay. And we're part of the church consult process. And what I found, even in the placement of pastors, where you go in, 
the first thing people want is, are they good preachers? Right, they always ask that question. I want to make sure they're a good preacher. If they're a good preacher, we want those. If they're not, we don't. There's, no, there's rarely discussion on whether or not it's an equipping pastor. Right. Will that pastor get me involved in sharing the gospel to sharing my faith with others? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe sometimes it's a little self-defeating where they, they're a little uncomfortable with the thought of being pushed out and driven out into mm -hmm. that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the process of sending out disciples here in a future program as well. But our, the health and sustainability of the church going forward is absolutely dependent upon moving away from pastor dependence and moving back to our dependence upon Christ and how he wants us to walk with him as a disciple, making disciples by sharing our faith with others and discipling them in the way. And Jesus acknowledged that in Matthew 9, 37, he said to his disciples, and this is powerful, when we talk about the cycle of vision, goals, ministry, growth, vision, goals, ministry, growth, the Lord wasn't seeing the growth. And he said to his disciples, he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. If the Lord can turn the world upside down with 12, he began with 12. Yeah, what could yeah. he do with most of our congregations um, yeah. if they were actively involved in discipling others? So the work is, I mean, what we are called to do is to get back to the model of discipleship rather than just the model of good evangelists. And so in America, we get the glory, we get the glory uh, because of a good sermon or, or how oh, that was a powerful, powerful message. series or evangelist is so amazing, powerful evangelist. Yes. He, yet he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but I need some laborers. Yeah. And that's where discipleship comes in. Yeah. When I've, we are equipped, we go out, we go out and labor to bring others in. I think public evangelism, like even the net series, which was very forward thinking, very, um, technologically advanced at the time has lost its oomph because the members have disengaged. It's all about how many flyers can we get out? That's, that's not member engagement in, no. in the harvest field. That is just, in fact, uh, I did a series, um, I won't tell you which church, and I knew that the success of that was dependent upon whether or not the members themselves would get involved in bringing their friends, mm. coworkers, family. And some of them responded this way, I don't have any friends that, I, that are not Adventist. Others said, I don't have any neighbors nearby. Some said, my neighbors don't like me. <laughs> and then afterward, some of them said, I wish I had come, but I just, I didn't come. And the reason why I didn't is because I already know all the information you're going to share. We don't have you there at a series to know the information. We have you there to connect with other people. That's right. And that is the focus of the church. Wow. That is a disciple focused church. And therefore, as you'll discover, friends, one of the first components of discipleship is Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to come after me, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. If you deny yourself, Christ can be first and you can be an effective disciple. God bless you.